of commerce and industry. Yeah, sorry. Thank you. Thank you, Pushpa, for starting the recording. Yeah, once again, good evening, everyone. And on behalf of Women's India Chamber of Commerce and Industry, Delhi Sustainable Business Council, I welcome all of you to the third talk on native plants. And uh, I think Valerie has been kind enough to do it the last two weeks as well. And the attendance in this program has been phenomenal. And we thank all of you for joining it. We really need to promote native plants. So to tell you a little about Wiki, uh, DSBC, it's an apex body for sustainable businesses for women in the state of Delhi. Wiki DSBC envisions to bring about fundamental changes in governmental policies, laws, and incentives with a view to encourage and empower women in sustainable business, industry, and commerce across all sectors and fields. It aims to enable individuals, communities, and businesses to work together to create a vibrant, healthy, and sustainable Delhi. Wiki DSPC achieves its three-pronged mission to research, empower, advocate through the following three verticals, facts, not fiction, which aims to spread data-driven knowledge and expertise on sustainable business practices through webinars, fireside chats, research paper, and case study publications. Rise and Shine, which looks at empowering women-led sustainable businesses by providing an ag aggregating platform through networking events, internships, etc. Nudge for Change, which is the advocacy vertical, which will draft actionable policy briefs and nudge relevant stakeholders towards more sustainable practices. And to take this discussion forward, as I said, we have with us our council member, Valerie Shield. Valerie is an urban ecologist, urban gardener, and an urban farmer. She's currently pursuing a PhD in urban ecology from North Carolina State University, USA, studying the role of urban trees in Delhi from ecological and sociocultural perspectives. She's fascinated by nature in the city and spends an inordinate amount of time with the birds, bees, butterflies, plants, and trees around us, observing and enjoying them. She has an annual pop-up native plant nursery in her house where she grows native plants from seeds and distributes the saplings for plantation across the city. She has been engaging her neighborhood community, including school children, into doing a tree census of the street trees of her colony and has logged over 5,000 trees in their database information that is crucial for the conservation of street trees. Thank you very much, Valerie for um, organizing these talks. And uh, we, she would be speaking to uh, Mr. Suhail Madan, who is a naturalist today. And all this while we were talking about native plants and which are, which are plants which are native to Delhi NCR, what should we grow? What should we grow in our homes? What should we grow in our neighborhood? But today uh, we are expanding this discussion and going to talk about butterflies and birds and what are the plants that they like. Over to you, Valerie, to take the discussion forward. Thank you so much, Fazia. Thank you for that wonderful introduction. Um, which, like, like when I hear my introduction, I'm like, wow, like that's really long. <laughs> but today, I am so happy to have um, Sohail here with us. He is a naturalist, yes, but he is also the uh, center manager for the conservation uh, education center of BNHS, which is the Bombay Natural History Society in Delhi. And it is based out of the Asola Bharti Wildlife Sanctuary. And, you know, he and his team have done such wonderful work over the last few years. And I just wanted to share uh, some of the images with you. If you haven't visited a solar party wildlife sanctuary, you definitely need to go there. <laughs> so uh, it's, you know, on the border of Delhi, Gurgaon, Faridabad, and just they have created such a beautiful native plant habitat. Um, and so he will be talking to us more about this today. And he had shared some images and I couldn't resist sharing them here with everyone. Uh, so typical like forest type of the Aravalis and um, the lake over here actually so i have also never been to this lake so next time i need to i need to come here you need to take me here yes. <laughs> and yeah they they have a number of nature trails um and this beautiful lily pond that they've, they've established near uh, the office building 
and they have done such an amazing job that the apex predator is now found there so the apex predator for our region which is the common leopard and i'm assuming this is this is a photograph from the sanctuary right so yes yes fair yeah. and uh, they do a lot of work lot of conservation uh, programs awareness programs with citizens with school children uh, and of course uh, due to the pandemic they had to change their strategy but still a lot of amazing work going on there uh, they have an aravli forest center and they have this beautiful native tree nursery again which sohail will talk to us about today and a butterfly park and garden right there in the sanctuary and sohail has been associated with this delhi seed bank project uh, which um uh, again i will leave it up to him to talk about it uh so thank you so much for joining us today sohail i uh, you know i first i think we met him i don't know 7 8 years back and uh, i don't know i think it was regarding some you know i maybe came for some plantation activity yes. at the sanctuary yes and then you know by chance i i started growing plants and i said oh if you have seeds just give me the seeds and i'll try and grow them <laughs> and you know that's how we we kept in touch and then we started exchanging seeds and growing plants and you know talking about birds and butterflies and so hail is the reason i am interested in butterflies today <laughs> because of he is the original butterfly man for delhi i can honestly say that so thank you um, uh, for this uh, lovely introduction but uh, like you were saying the first time we met was a uh, plantation a monsoon plantation in a ravli in a sola i think and uh, uh, i remember you became our first uh, volunteer for the delhi seed bank project where you would hard shingar is something that you gave yes. us and they're all yes. doing very well as in it's a uh, yeah that you gave us the confidence that it's possible the people willing to do this so <laughs> well, thank you thank you so much and thank you so much for joining us today and you have a lot of fans because we have a great participation today <laughs> we've never had so many participants i said oh this is also hail's fan following which is coming <laughs> which is coming out here uh so just before we move on a couple of housekeeping rules uh i i do apologize that this is you know zoom meetings tend to not be as interactive as we would like them to be because of the you know the restrictions that we have uh but please do keep yourselves in, on mute do type in your queries and questions in the chat box we will take them up during the discussion and at the end of the session and if you're not able to get back to you right now we will get back to you on email so leave us your email and you can also of course contact us on email anytime uh you can follow us on our social media channels and uh you know feel free to send in any queries uh anytime we will connect you with the right resources if you know if we don't have access to them immediately we look for them and connect you with them um and yeah that's it that's it that's our email that uh, you know you can write to us at that and these are our social media channels and basically over to you sohail and the you know i said the first question that i always start with you know we've been having this talk on native plants right now because you know in monsoons there is usually a planting frenzy so we thought you know let's talk about the right planting practices and the right plants you mm -hmm. know that we should plant and uh, so if you have like a smaller space like a balcony or terrace or home garden or a small space you're planting in there is plenty of time to plant this year as well but of course if you have a very large plantation site then you need to plan in advance and this is the time you can start planning in advance for planting next year so this turns out to be the best time to you know talk about these things and so so hail i will start with the first question which is again you know what are native plants and why should we be talking about native plants so uh well let me uh begin by uh uh saying thanks for such an opportunity that you've uh, invited me over to discuss these plants i think uh as you've been saying i think native plants are really important 
and such uh, discussions and uh, such outreach is uh, it's really required at this point of time. And uh, lots of people want to do good things, uh, providing sharing information which will help them achieve their you know goals regarding a green lifestyle or a green living space. Uh, much more easily. I think it's uh, really important stuff that you're doing. Coming to what I feel are native plants, this is like a, you know, a learning process. Uh, there is no set line. There is no proper definition. But uh, how I look at it is that uh, native plants are firstly plants belonging to your biogeographic region. So uh, it begins by understanding what my biogeographic region is. I am in Delhi, south of Delhi. Uh, we are at the confluence of the semi-arid Aravli, ancient Aravli range and the uh, Yamuna flood plains. So uh, there are different habitats. There's a lot of biodiversity, uh, but our plantation or our choice of plants should be dictated by these two habitat types or these two forest types. Second, uh, these plants, uh, native plants, uh, would be those plants which are found on our historical records. Uh, if you go back to what the Britishers were doing, keeping records of the native flora and fauna, uh, there's a lot of information telling you what the forest was like before uh, this development surge of you know, degradation started. Uh, apart from that, there are also some, <clears throat> fortunately, there are some areas which we can call as reference sites, which are left around us, undisturbed, uh, not degraded at all, almost like a pristine forest. There are lots of examples you will know of also, and people listening would also like Mangarbani, uh, Parson Temple, or... Uh, even some parts of Masola, there are these sites that you can study and then try and replicate what a, understand what a native uh, plant would be for that region. Uh, these plants are also well suited to the hot and cold of Delhi, these extreme weather conditions that they are here. And uh, uh, if you keep these guiding principles in mind, you can make your own bank of what uh, native, what native species would be like. And there's Lots of good work done by Padeep Kishan, uh, Vijay Dashmana, which uh, is ca can be used as a guiding tool towards understanding what are native plants. But uh, as a biological def definition, it's a very hard concept to wrap your head around. For example, uh, Imli, would everybody would believe, is an Indian uh, <laughs> native plant. It's even called Tamarind indicasa. So... Uh, but it's a sub-Saharan African plant. So it's a, there's a lot of confusion. Scientists and researchers can discuss that. Uh, taxonomists can have a detailed paper on it. But for a layman, these are the guiding principles. Uh, or at least this is what I go by. And uh, Imli uh, and Neem, both of them, highly debated. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. <laughs> And of course, uh, why these plants are important is because these plants, uh, native plants share a evolutionary, long, ancient evolutionary relationship with the local wildlife, be it uh, your porcupines, jackals, or be it your uh, birds and butterflies. And this cannot be replicated uh, using exotics. So like Pradeep, uh, says a lot of times that uh, if you get a polar bear from the Arctic and keep it in Delhi Zoo, you would have to provide refrigeration. So if I get some plant from South America, it needs to be in a tropical place. So uh, yeah. that's why it's important. It'll, these plants will also lead less water. They will uh, do well without any care because they're you know well adapted to this area. And uh, getting exotics has this danger that we all know of, like, uh, like a great example is this Prosophis juliflora, uh, Vilaiti Kikar. Uh, some brought here with good intentions, 
and now uh, invasive dire invasive threat to uh, most uh, forests in our region there's some forests and tropical forests where it hasn't you know uh, taken hold but our forests especially forests which have seen a little uh, level of degradation that's where it does very well and uh, uh, plants like that pose a great threat uh, you know threat so yeah eucalypt is also a great example yeah so I this is always, you know i think I always think of German shepherds and I think, oh my gosh, you know, how uncomfortable they must be in the heat of the city. <laughs> um, and just, yeah, just think of all the resources you have to provide to them so that they are comfortable. And, you mm -hmm. know, it's the same with exotic plants. Like some of them with exotic plants, some of them which are from other tropical areas adapt very well. But like you said, they have the danger of becoming invasive because they don't have their you know, natural predators out here and we don't know how how it will play out. Yeah, I believe so, so uh, I believe we shouldn't be playing God of, yeah. you know, picking and choosing uh, things from all over the world and trying to uh, grow them in my garden. Instead, I should be actually helping God in what his creation has already, you know, presented us with. So, forests near me are as beautiful as any tropical forest that I have been to till now. They have their own beauty. Every place has their own, every landscape has their own uh, story to tell. And uh, Aravli is a, you know, is my favorite landscape and it has a very, very long story to tell. And so coming to the topic of the Aravli is, you know, I was talking to you yesterday and we were talking about the different forest types and you have shared some images. And I think it would be really nice to, uh, you know, talk about these. So I can, uh, you know, put on these images and can you t tell us a little bit about the different forest types, the habitat types within the Aravalis? I mean, it was, it's sort of a revelation that, you know, even within the Aravali range, you can have different forest types, like mm -hmm. that sensation, like we don't usually think of it that way. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, when we look at, a, uh, when a layman looks at the Ravli forest, he just seeds a prickly forest with very little diversity, but that's not true. Aravali helps Delhi being the one of the most biodiverse cities in the world. We have a lot of bird diversity. We have a good population of butterflies. We have a lot of green areas still with us. So uh, I think given what we have, it's imperative that we try and understand the different types of forests that you will actually see in when you see a landscape. It's easy to dismiss it as one, but there's so much layering involved in these forests that have taken such a long time to you know, be here. If I look at an Aravli forest, and if I want to explain an Aravli forest to a layman trying to you know, just introduce what a forest would look like, I would start out with a um, flat land. So uh, Aravlis are, un, are like uh, rolling hills of not of not too much height, right? So and they are dry. So the type of landscapes that you can see are uh, open flatlands uh, and rolling hills. Hills would have uh, levels as you go up the hill. And all these hills and flatlands would also have valleys. So to understand the Ravli landscape, we do need to understand what species inhabit the flatlands, what happened, what is happening in the valleys, and exactly the same, what is happening in the uh, hill slopes. So flatlands are usually desert thorn forest, which are open canopy. Would you like me to go through these images or would you like me to uh and then uh, as in i'm going to go into a or? sequence so if you can as in i'm starting right. out with the desert on flatlands and so i don't know if the it's the same sequence <laughs> hopefully <laughs> so <clears throat> flatlands would be characterized by uh kumta forest okay and the okay. kumta forest is a open canopy forest, of course, dominated by uh, uh, Kumta, as I'm saying, 
and it would also have uh, gangeti it would have uh, our karil it will have uh, uh, changli karonda but uh, they are going to be placed slightly apart it's going to be rocky and sandy with very little moisture right somebody is saying that they can't really hear us is that a problem um no i think they need to check their audio because it's working okay. fine over here don't worry okay. yeah so moving on from so this is a, a kumta here and uh, they make these clusters and that's the only species that you will see very close by otherwise the forest is going to be uh, sparsely uh, populated and uh, lots of open areas when we go towards the hill the gentler slopes of the hill turn into what we call a khair forest khair forest would be a uh, uh, forest which is uh, it has a gentler slope open canopy again and uh, this open canopy uh, would have of course it would have khair but apart from that it would also have species like uh, chamrod ronj going to be accompanying this uh, the on these gentler slopes there's a unique feature in aravli forest that if the the slope is really steep these forests are dominated by what we call the thau forest zanagisus pendula and a remarkable forest of aravli uh, uh, range this is a dense forest in a place which when uh, in a landscape where nothing else will grow this will take over the whole hill sides and make pure forest of 95 85% of thau with some parna or ronj thrown in for good measure uh, see that's what yeah that's what it looks like mangarbani is a good uh, uh, area to go check it out as we go up this uh, um, hill the hill tops are dominated by kullu and salai so bosivela serada forest and uh, uh, gurjan is also a good tree from these heights these are uh, plants of higher reaches and a very few areas uh, especially in delhi around delhi have such forest existing and uh, uh, now that we talked about the flatlands and the um, uh, slopes we can move on to the valleys so the when we talk about valleys there will be three types of valleys one is going to be a valley of thau forest the if the slope has a, a thau on it these valleys would hold a lot of water and would have a would be almost like a subtropical deciduous forest so a lot of woodland there'll be uh, people there'll be burger there'll be cam uh, there'll be chinjiri uh, closed woodland with closed canopy very dense forest okay and uh, then there are two other types of valleys that we should be talking about also one is a a, a open valley which has which sees seasonal flooding and uh, uh, has a uh, has deep clay deposits this made for the palash forest and these open valleys uh, are dominated by these at every say 10 feet 12 feet you'll see a palash uh, best place best time to visit this is uh, right before holi yeah when the palash is flowering and uh, the uh, accompanying species for this forest would be bistendu uh, there'll be a lot of heens there'll be a lot of uh, jungli karonda uh, but sometimes the these seasonal valleys are uh, depositing a lot of silt over a very long period of time and they they become these open spaces with a lot of deep soil this is where desi babul does really well so these forests would be dominated by uh, desi babul with uh, miswak pilu being a accompanying plant and chal being a accompanying plant uh, or also has heens in it and there apart from this landscape that i have dis described there are some special places which have perennial water sources uh, which will turn into 
uh, grasslands or Kajur forest, that person temple that you are show, showing. They're very yeah, unique. that is amazing. Like I've never seen it. Like, never. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's actually uh, the source of uh, uh, <clears throat> Badkal Lake. Now the water doesn't reach Badkal mm. Lake, but this is where right. one of the sources. It, it's actually the spring is still. Uh, the, there's water in the spring still. Mm. So there'll be this. Uh, lots of people don't know wild date is also Kajur is a native plant. They think it's a type of a palm and you know, same category as royal palm or something. It's not actually, it's a slow growing, very, uh, very, very native tree of uh, uh, our region. Yeah, value. You know, if you hadn't, if you hadn't uh, mentioned this to be in Haryana and you know, one could easily mistake it for somewhere in Southeast Asia. That's yes. the kind of look this space has, right? I mean, you can you can imagine the never, valley below has a lot of water. <laughs> so this yeah, should give you an indication sure. that the valley below has a lot of water. So yeah. this, yeah, yeah. So to understand how water staying in landscapes and flowing through it affects the soil there, and how these two factors affect the uh, plants that you'll find there is how you can understand the micro habitats of Arab. That was amazing. I mean, and this is the grassland ecosystem. I mean, just imagine having so many different types within one region. It's kind of mind boggling, but it's how nature works. Yes. And, you know, I think a part of the work you've been doing with restoration is, uh, and you've shown us a lot of these spaces with, from within the Asola Bhati Wildlife Sanctuary, which was, of course, uh, you know, it's a former mining habitat. So I'm assuming all these photographs are after the restoration work that has been done yes. over there. Yes. So that's that's just so amazing. That is so, um, uh, Asola has really, been a mining really site for I don't know since prehistoric uh, times, and uh, uh, getting a chance to restore such a place, such a degraded place, is actually. Uh, is actually a great opportunity to learn from the landscape. Uh, nothing came easy in the sense that a lot of people have worked before us and have evolved a methodology and that's how we know what works, what, what doesn't work, uh, uh, what people have, what are the best practices people have been doing and uh, uh, what we try and focus while we are doing restoration is not on plantations, our focus is more on assistive regeneration of critical habitats. We try and, so my, a lot of my work is about monitoring biodiversity. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, that's been one of the key connections I have with uh, my study of Aravli plants. Uh, by studying the biodiversity, we try and understand uh, what the health of the landscape is. And, uh, uh, seeing forests grow or people attempting to grow forests through these mass plantation, uh, we have realized that this sort of uh, method won't work in our area. So we try and do uh, assistive regeneration of specific plants in specific areas where we know it's going to directly affect the wildlife around it or some special species that depend on that area. Right. Right. And that, that's a very interesting point because, you know, uh, that was also one of the things that prompted the series of talks because everybody's claiming, oh, we planted three lakh trees or, you know, 10 million trees have been planted, but where are they? Because none of us can find them. So we don't know where they are. So let's focus on doing what we can, you know, let's um, get what educated works. on what is the right way of doing things yes, and yes. do these things on our personal level. At least we'll know where those trees and plants are. Oh yeah, that's, <laughs> that's of going to be a to very important claims. part of knowing where these plants is going to be a yeah. very important part of how we take this thing forward. Right. So, so he'll tell us, you know, we've touched upon so many things. Tell us about your journey. How did you reach native plants? Like mine, you know, mine was, I think, inspired somewhat by the Delhi Seed Bank project that you started. 
of course i think all of us have been inspired by pradeep krishan because i don't think you know without that none of us would have started absolutely and so so you know t- tell us about your journey uh so uh, while as you know i'm a trained engineer trained in maharashtra trained and worked in maharashtra and uh, california but uh, uh i always knew that i don't want to sit behind a desk i always wanted to be a person being outside and slowly over the years being outside i realized that you have to have something to do outside and that quest of knowing stuff if i stay outside and i start knowing what is outside all the natural stuff that is outside it's a never ending journey and somewhere down the line i decided that uh, being a lifelong member of bnhs uh, i was i saw this opportunity uh, of running this center at asura wadi wildlife sanctuary and uh, uh, saw the potential and i'm actually very grateful to uh, the director then to have given me this opportunity to you know uh, open hand and uh, i must have been very naive coming in with my idealistic you know phase of changing the world and all that but uh, believing in me and giving me the strength to you know actually go and try and do some things that will affect change in my city uh, i am from delhi this seemed to be a perfect place to do what i'm doing but uh, my actual journey about um, native plants starts from i would say 2013 14 we were given a a project of uh, the solar butterfly park and uh, i knew somewhat about butterflies and i knew somewhat about gardening that's all i started with but uh, i believe that uh, studying the um, uh, monitoring the biodiversity in uh, uh, solar i believe that uh it would be very easy to achieve in the sense that if i make a, a forest if i make something like a forest then i can get a lot of uh, butterflies that won't be the tough part of it to do this we me and my team went across the uh india we saw all the butterfly parks that existed at that time be it chandigarh be it uh, bangalore we uh went to rao jodha park to see how the restoration has been carried out there try to understand uh, from people actually building these parks about what is the best way to do it what what are the ways uh, what are the complaints people have uh, what sort of boards they should be what should be done for the people and what should be done for the butterflies so I'm trying to understand the intricacies uh it took us across the country and i'm uh, glad for the experience uh we put all that we gathered from these places into this uh four acre place to start with then we have expanded it to a, a double the size but uh uh when we were building this butterfly park <clears throat> we came across a very fundamental problem most of these butterflies are dependent on local native trees and to get these local native trees was impossible no nursery had it no sarkari nursery had it no private nursery had it nobody was growing it we had to go to jodhpur afri to get some seeds some plants or go on field visits on our own uh, in rajasthan to get pradeep also helped us out from his nursery in the beginning gave us some plants so uh when we realized that even if people have a good intention of planting natives they are helpless because of lack of plants we devised a program is how we met you delhi seed bank project in which we thought that uh we will do tree walks and seed collection walks with the uh, uh general public students uh, in try and involve people something like what you are doing uh talking about native trees in the same at the same time collecting those native seeds and handing it out to the participants themselves so they could uh, 
grow and nurture those plants and bring them back to us for our restoration work in the uh, in Asolabati. And uh, uh, we, you like volunteers like you came up. You helped us out with plants. Uh, colleges like Zakir Hussain uh, College in South Delhi in uh, South Delhi campus. Yeah. Uh, they came forward. They helped us. They gave us a lot of ronj which we have planted. So uh, a lot of people got in with this process of you know this distributive nursery, where people would grow them, nurture them for some time, and give us uh, plants which are healthy and plantation ready. Because you know if you plant a young sapling for restoration work uh, right out there in the jungle. It doesn't do very well. The mortality is very high. So we thought a period of incubation of 18 months to 24 months would be a good time for us to get the plants back. Eventually, uh, this thing has picked on now. People, a lot of people are talking about native plantation. Uh, uh, now the uh, Delhi Forest Department is also very, very interested. Uh, so this year, uh, they have uh, given us a space uh, to make a model uh, Aravli forest nursery, which would be dedicated to just uh, Aravli plants and not just trees. We are focusing on uh, grafts, we are focusing on uh, shrubs, small trees, like basically trying to make a three-tire forest. And uh, if hopefully uh, we do well, and if this does well, there are other nurseries with the department which this would be expanded to. So, uh, just to give an example, uh, I think not many kumthas would have been planted last year uh, uh, in monsoon plantations all across Delhi. But this time, I'm definitely sure that I can provide 10,000 of these kumthas. So right now we yes. are providing. You can see kumta. it's right in right. front. <laughs> yes, yes. So this, we have yeah. the kumta right in front. <laughs> yeah, and it's a great looking tree with a, a fantastic character, you know. And uh, of course, you can go into these trees and find their medicinal value and their um, religious, cultural significance and all that. But uh, it's a plant which will do well in the most rocky places, in most places where things won't grow, uh, has great flowering uh, period where lots of butterflies are attracted to it. So, you know, uh, the native plants have their place. And if we can talk about uh, people wanting to plant it, but if we don't supply these plants, I don't think uh, the job is done. So at this point in time, I'm really happy that we have this nursery going. I want it to be successful so this model can be replicated at a larger scale. Like right now, we're looking at a capacity of 1 lakh, which we can we will be expanding very soon to about 3 lakhs. But if I get if we get 14 such other nurseries going doing it, you can imagine the scale that we are talking about. And all our plantation needs could be taken care of from... Uh, the work Boris Department can put in. Yeah, that uh, I think that really is the idea out there, right? Um, to plant what the day to we grow, met, the to day sow. We met, well, sorry, yes. sorry to interrupt. The day we met, mm -hmm. uh, we planted I think six fifty native plants. All oh, right, just two weeks back. No, no, the, the day. Then, I think, the first day, back then, in 2015 when we met. Years back, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and lots of people ask me, uh, you know, people are planting 30,000 plants in their plantation. How come you are only managing 650? And my answer was, I, I'm only managing what I can, you know, maintain. If I can't maintain it, what's the point of planting? What's the pl point of planting in places where I know they'll not survive? What's the, you know, why do tokenism? Why not That's, do uh, That is really, I think, one of the challenges, you know, plaguing our plantation practices today because we have everybody making these loud claims, you know, we've already mentioned it about, you know, how many lakhs have been planted, but 
unless we can take care of them and plants require they require some maintenance you have to nurture them for a certain period of time until they can establish themselves and then you leave them but you have to be able to do that and uh, there are some you know some uh, some basic guidelines basic principles you can follow for that and we have you know talked about them in the past and we can definitely talk about it in the future but today you know we've promised people to talk about butterflies and birds <laughs> and um <clears throat> of course like the connection between biodiversity and plants is something that you've already and native trees and plants is something you've already expanded upon you know when you started with the idea of the butterfly park you realized oh we need native plants <laughs> Yes. Right. Yes. So it it started from butterflies and not from plants. Yes. yes <laughs> so that yes. that's a uh, you know uh, that's an interesting uh, way of moving towards plants. Yeah, I was a normal and gardener. Like, I was a normal gardener. I like money plant as much as like any other plant. You know, uh, growing plants is a uh, is a healthy hobby, a hobby of mine. You know, but. Uh, <laughs> my need or my actual study of these native plants and understanding what has gone wrong you know uh, i failed to mention this fact that most of these uh, trees are disappearing like pilu is a good example to see a old uh, pilu or meetha jal or miswak uh, you would have to go to kutub minar or sundar nursery so as we have preserved the kutub minar we have preserved a few trees otherwise all the trees have been cut due to over exploitation or uh, local use or just development so these plants are not just effective in your plantations not just effective for birds and butterflies but uh, they are also very important uh, in terms of uh, keeping our city green pollution free having uh, uh, these plants not disappear you know but we are in a position where uh, slowly we we'll lose all of these uh, local plants and we'll be left with only exotics like royal palm and that would be a very very sad day so before that happens i think we need rapid action yeah that and yeah. you know the thing is they they require we everybody has mentioned it they because they evolve they evolve with with the climate with the soil with everything they actually do require minimal maintenance and they are beautiful it's just that we haven't we don't see them around so much so we don't realize that beauty but they are stunning in their own way absolutely and you know we need to retrain our eyes and our minds to to recognize that beauty yeah you have to look at them with that cultural context and i think it'll open your mind to one of the most beautiful like salai is bosivela mm-hmm. serata is a beautiful tree if i had seen it in any other country or any other landscape i would have fallen in love with it but it is a tree endemic to india and hardly seen in delhi from which landscape it belongs to is that's sad i would say yeah. sad that we don't love our endemic so much or even a little we we actually i think it's just because we don't have them around so much right so this is a way of kind of remedying that and bringing about yes. that change where we if we have them all around us we will automatically start to fall in love with them yeah. and yeah. um and so coming you know coming to butterflies mm-hmm. uh i think you know my first my first memory of butterflies is from my childhood when there was a park over here and that was sort of wild and you know we used to go there to catch butterflies and it was <laughs> someone uh, uh, an older lady who used to come and watch us for a couple of hours and she was very good at catching them you know she would just clap her hands like this and then catch the butterflies <laughs> and they were the tiny the blues butterflies yes. um, that we know that i know they are the blues butterflies now <laughs> and i would bring them home in those small like those kodak bottles you would have Film, yes, the the, films, the, the film, the film thing. <laughs> and yeah, and then show them to my mom. Are they butterflies? She would say, "Chhod do usko, chhod do." You know, that's a very cruel thing to do. So please don't do that. No, but kids do this. But, but 
Right, but uh, you know what? After that, I don't have any memories of butterflies. They've disappeared from our psyche, from our sight. And I was just wondering about this yesterday and I said, oh yeah, because one of the reasons probably is because our landscapes have become so manicured, we cannot support butterflies anymore. So yes. we, are, we are not yes. seeing them in the same numbers. And so really, uh, you know, last year when I attended a couple of courses with you on butterflies and that got me really interested. And then uh, so here was the first one who got me started on my butterfly garden also. So BNHS has been doing a number of butterfly gardens uh, across the city. And, uh, you know, so Hale started, gave some of these plants to me as well. I started out with some of them. And, you know, since then it's only grown. I have too many pots and not enough space. But I have a ton of butterflies now. <laughs> so uh, purpose achieved. In fact, while talking to him yesterday, I was like, oh, I saw six different species just while, you know, talking to him. <laughs> and so it doesn't take much. That's the idea. It doesn't take much. You can build this garden in your balcony, on your terrace. You can have four pots, you know, that could be native butterfly friendly yes. uh, uh, plants. You can do it in your neighborhood parks. So from a small space to a large space, you know, any space is good for butterflies. And um, of course, we'll come to the uh, the plants. But Sohil, do you want to talk about uh, the plants yes, first? Yes, let's, uh, let's start. This there? is one of my favorite. This is one of my favorite projects. So uh, give me two minutes to talk about this corridor, and yes. then we'll move on to the plants. Okay, so. Yes. Uh, why I say this is one of my favorite projects is because uh, I, uh, like has already mentioned, work with the Conservation Education Center. And uh, most, of my work, most of my work is uh, people facing. And I call myself a propagandist for nature. And butterfly corridors or butterfly gardens has given, like butterflies to its bahana, has given me a window of meeting and interacting with people from varied backgrounds, varied institutions with a common interest of what is driving them is butterflies. And uh, with help of such, you know, green guardians, you can call them, of their areas, we have been managed, we have been managed to build over around 60 now habitats. This 55, we're going to do five more uh, the next butterfly month in September and the idea is to connect the natural forest of <coughs> uh, from south of Delhi to north of Delhi in this circle-ish thing that you see. Uh, like I said, Delhi is a, has a lot of green spaces but most of it is now not contiguous. It has been uh, uh, detached from each other because of uh, the urban sprawl. So our idea is very simple using again discrete small habitats uh, to enable butterflies to freely go across the city, uh, helping uh, improve their genetic health. You know, we don't want wildlife to be in isolation. We don't want to turn all our national parks into practically zoos. We want some sort of a corridor. So we can't make a corridor for leopards. We can't make a corridor for nail guys, but we can for butterflies. And who knows, such ideas will take fold and uh, <clears throat> we can do it for other species also. But apart from what we are doing with butterflies for this corridor, making habitats and trying to increase their population abundance, we are also getting uh, people concerned about their, uh, uh, you know, surroundings. I'll tell you, I'll give you a very good example. Uh, we have uh, uh, a very uh, deep friend, good friend of mine, uh, a volunteer, a butterfly lover. He used to come to a butterfly park uh, called uh, Anil Kapoor Sir. Uh, worked in sh for shipping, uh, worked in shipping for all his life. Now is retired in Mandakini and Thave. And he wanted to, uh, you know, make a park. We helped him out. We gave him some plants. He arranged for most of the plants. Uh, he got the RW involved. He got the local MLA involved. It, it became the park became a center of focus, not for just our study of uh, uh, butterfly monitoring, but also for the people living there. 
and i'll you'll be really surprised well that uh, uh, mandakini had a problem of this heavy pruning of trees and that pruning uh, extended to the mandakini butterfly park which wasn't acceptable to the butterfly lovers of that area and now uh, they took this to the department to the forest department to the concerned authorities now not just their butterfly park but the whole colony is safe of this heavy pruning they have been uh, fined heavily the people have been taken to task for what has happened and this is exactly what we need it's not about butterflies it's about these people taking ownership of the green spaces around them trying to make them ecologically sound and having the strength and knowledge to actually try and uh, change people's mindset or if given an opportunity of or if the uh, uh, situation is such that they need to put up a fight that can also be possible if you are invested like i say to uh, you need to know something to like something to love something to save something right if you don't go through this process there is no saving you can't if i i can't save the oceans if i am not connected to them i need to find a connection to actually start caring caring for it otherwise i don't care if i don't see it yeah, i don't care and, so this has been a very yeah. important aspect of this project which i am really proud of and you know i feel uh, you know the reason we picked up on birds and butterflies are because we do see them around us and like you said you know it might be hard to build a corridor for leopards or nilgai but it's easier to build habitats for these um, you know these taxa these smaller animals yes. and they're also so likable you know i i mean who doesn't like butterflies and who yes. doesn't like birds except maybe for the crow <laughs> <laughs> so they are very very likable uh, animals we love to have them around and it's easier to you know to create spaces for them you know even uh, we can do so much even in small spaces yeah yeah it's so, easier uh, than it's easier than anybody i think we lost you there Okay, you're back on. Yes, I'm back on. Sorry, the light went away. Internet, yeah. <laughs> yes, yes. Please. So, uh, you know, of course, and we have people joining in from across the country. And um, one of the things I want to mention here is that for butterflies, for birds, for encouraging biodiversity in your areas, you need to look at the local flora of your areas, the native vegetation yes. of your particular areas. and unfortunately we don't have time to go into that for every single region of the country but if you have questions about that do write in to us and we will definitely connect you to the correct resource person to help you out over there but right now we do have uh, you know the aravli plants that we can talk about and uh, sohail would you like to run us through them and tell yes. us you know because all of these you know i was looking at them and i was like oh i can have all of i have many of these in my garden and yes, i can yes, have yes. all of these and the trees are something you can absolutely have in your neighborhood parks and in your societies yeah and it'll be full of butterflies if you have planted the right tree <clears throat> so to begin with well uh, uh, let me touch upon a few things that <clears throat> you need to know about a butterfly habitat some things are really really important like Uh, your butterfly habitat has to be a place where no chemicals are being used nothing no fertilizers no pesticides no insecticides no chemicals which are these chemicals are poison for all insects even your caterpillars and your butterflies so uh, any place that is using such uh, poisons will not get butterflies no matter how right you plant no matter what you get uh secondly butterfly habitats or um, uh, parks where you want to invite butterflies should not be pruned heavily they should not be uh, you know you don't need to sweep the grass you don't need such uh, heavy maintenance is preferred that
we'll just give him a minute to come back online i think the rain um, and the weather okay. and there are lots of wild plants which science doesn't know that butterflies host on so uh, it's best to keep that you know you never know uh, like oxtalis will come when this is the right time if you get rid of it it is a great nectar plant for butterflies so you will need to get seasonal flowers so depending on the seasonal flowers i am flowers, i am I guilty be... of that so i am the first person to remove oxalis from everywhere because i think oh it's a weed and then this year i saw you know all the blues butterflies nectaring on it and i was like ah oh, i have to leave them in just let them be <laughs> let it be yes, for I, a little while i had the same story with chuloi for all my gardening uh, uh, hobby i have been getting rid of chuloi thinking that oh overcrowding and what not but chuloi is a great host plant for pale grass blue dark grass blue and it's also a great nectaring plant for all these small blues now i, I it's my perspective is completely changed now i see the beauty of these chuloi amaranthus plants and i go this is so beautiful mm. so that that's that is the mindset that we have to change and uh with that mindset if you work in a butterfly work towards a butterfly garden you will definitely find success so uh with with that let me move, move on to uh the plants that we can discuss today uh i this is a great place to uh start out because this is a host plant for the zebra blue butterfly that you see here on the screen and uh we have a white flower plant and a blue flower plant white is our local chitra it's the desi variety and blue is the horticulture variety while in this case zebra blue caterpillars can host on both of these plants but in most cases that is not true so uh if you put a blue flambago you will get zebra blue butterfly if you put a white chitra which is the native variety you will get zebra blue butterflies but this is not true for most uh, cases and very interesting thing about this butterfly the the caterpillar you see the picture in the center this is a very small uh, uh, a small flower bud and in the middle there is that small caterpillar so if you're doing butterfly gardening it's not important it's not just enough to know uh, which butterfly and which caterpillar are uh, uh, related to which plant it's also important uh, to know where you will find the caterpillar if you really want to find them if you want to see them so uh, while can we move on to the next one yeah and chitrak is a beautiful flower it's really beautiful so this is again another hardy uh, drought tolerant will grow anywhere kind of plant a medicinal plant called pilo vajranti vajranti we will all heard of uh, surprisingly we don't plant it it's a great garden plant to have uh, winter it will flower profusely the less you take care of it the more beautiful it will look uh, lots of pansies yellow pansy lemon pansy use this but use this plant as their host so great addition to have anybody can do it another one and is and it makes uh, a great bush also so instead of using uh, you know your uh, ficus benjamina as a bush just just plant this yeah yeah this is a great great bush to have anywhere where you can't yeah. water it a place where you can't water would you put bajanti in yeah absolutely Amazing. true next one man this is heens kanthari one of my favorite plants uh, does very well with cuttings you will usually see them growing in termite mounds or next to these vilaiti kikars just take a cutting in the monsoon season and plant it and do very very well uh, otherwise you it grows from seeds also seeds are also coming uh, will start coming now and uh, host for a lot of butterflies flowers profusely at the right time you can see caterpillars of orange tips of pioneers at some time it, you can find the plant to be full of butterfly caterpillar so it has that uh, potential, great potential as a butterfly plant but 
it is also a plant that will do well in most situations uh will make a hardy bush sometimes a very pleasant looking big bush but mostly a very small bush yeah some uh, plant i would promote and i would like everybody to plant uh this is uh, our castor our r and d it grows in most waste lands or uh in our drains this is easily and readily available seeds profusely uh castor plant is a host plant for castor butterflies and uh, seeds for this can be these are the seeds you can see which would blast open and before they do that you can collect the seeds and grow them on your own once you plant it uh it, it might stay for 2 3 years or it will keep seeding reseeding and coming back in the same place so you know we have castor along all the road sides and neglected parts of our parks and gardens we should definitely go and hunt for this butterfly over there yes yes mostly uh, it's in places where horticulturists and gardeners will clear it up so before before yeah. they do that get your hands on few then the milkweed uh, madar or safed oak or the other calidropis procera the local mm -hmm. variety there this family supports the plain tiger butterfly the caterpillars feed on the leaves and interestingly the leaves are this alkaloid which makes the butterfly toxic and uh, um, the but of then the butterfly is safe from predators but apart from that it's a beautiful flowering plant again a plant of waste sites grows uh, almost everywhere uh, flowers have religious significance uh, pollinated by bees uh, i've read a paper where about in our region about 100 species different species from different taxa depend on this uh, plant so a uh, great plant and we culturally have had a tradition of having at least one of these in our uh, uh, you know in our gardens and yeah so i think and i you know with the, with all these plants which have this some religious significance i always see that they have great uh, ecological uh, biodiversity value and i yes, i suspect yes. that is why they became significant for purposes of religion yes, because yes, that was yes. one and, way to conserve and in well in cases in them. cases you don't find that in cases a plant has uh, religious or cultural significance and uh, biologically you don't know of any uh, you know use of it that usually means that science hasn't come to what the religion and exactly. culture already know it not it's yeah. not the other way around usually it's that oh we are studying the pharmacology of the leaves of acacia nilotica yeah. <laughs> and we are finding out great stuff and i uh, i think what's interesting is you know that we don't have any of these plants in our gardens anymore i literally like i go somewhere i'm like mujhe भैया ये अरंडी का पौधा निकाल के मुझे दे दो जरा या ये आग का हो रहा है यू नो कैन यू आप बस निकाल दो आपको तो क्या चाहिए जंगली है सब जगह होता है start small yeah. at least find the love for these plants again this is again a very interesting plant uh, patthar chatta uh, a local indigenous variety of kalincho a uh, succulent uh, does well under shade also so you can plant it in a shady spot when nothing else could be planted does well in a sunny spot a uh, caterpillar of red piro burrows itself inside the leaf and spends the whole time eating through the leaf and then skips on to the other uh, leaf before going on to becoming this beautiful butterfly this is actually a really interesting butterfly which wasn't found in delhi but uh, uh, has colonized delhi now due to most plants uh, in delhi nurseries coming from these big nurseries in pune so in one of the plants a red pillow caterpillar has arrived here and has colonized uh, delhi as one of its places uh, 
uh, why I say it's very interesting is because uh, this shows you uh, the power of our choice. What we choose to plant has great ramifications, even beyond what we can see or might be able to ever see. All these things, all the effects of our choice are best known in hindsight. When we are making these choices, we are not really aware of what it might lead to. So here it led to a good thing, but that's not always the case. So really want to stress that choice of plants really matter in how our ecology gets affected. It's one of my favorites because the red peru was the first butterfly to come to my yes. place after. And, you know, since then we've been here. I've also yeah, nurtured and a ton of them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, if you have red piru in your region, this is a great plant to plant in your butterfly, terrace butterfly garden because you will definitely get the butterfly and you will get a lot of them also. Exactly. It gives you that satisfaction. You'll get, I mean, you put the patta chata, you will get the red peru. I guarantee yes. you. Yes. You know, I've been telling people that. Yes. So moving on to some tree, this is the pilu that I was talking about, Miswak. You can see a big hole. It starts out like a small, it's a slow growing, hardy, salt resistant, drought resistant plant, uh, but very slow growing. So most of the life is spent like a shrub and a great micro habitat for nesting, for mongoose, for different animals using that big shrub. Eventually, after say a hundred years or so, it makes this trunk a very beautiful crooked trunk and uh, you can see a very old specimen near Kutub Minar. That's the picture. Here. The fruits are edible, loved by birds. Uh, uh, edible, the humans eat it too. Plus, uh, uh, salmon Arab butterfly, small salmon Arab mostly, makes uh, it a host plant. And, uh, you know, this is one of the saplings that uh, is becoming available at the native plant nurseries in Delhi. So if you do have a chance and a space where you can plant it, I would certainly suggest. But you do need to have uh, the right space. So take care of that. So, so, yeah. <clears throat> so next is this uh, Safed series, a beautiful tall tree of our region. Uh, I call it the musical series. The seed pods make this sound when the wind blows. Makes it a very beautiful, you know, tree to stand under in a windy day. Uh, plus beautiful flowers. These usually drop down after rains in the spring. And you can see them on our roads. It's just planted a lot in Avenue trees in South Delhi at least. And... Uh, Grass yellows make it a host plant. And our favorite, the amaltas. Yeah, the you can write books on amaltas. I think there's so much, <laughs> so much to. This uh, is actually even mentioned in the Mahabharat. Uh, when they made in the prast, they lined the tree. They line their avenues with the amaltas tree. So it that's has interesting. That kind of I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So the in the first city has been the the tree that they used to line the avenues. Like the British have used uh, evergreen trees, the Pandavs used uh, the amaltas. But uh, of course, it's a summer indicator. As soon as you see the uh, uh, amaltas flowering. Uh, you know right then that, oh, summer has arrived. It's going to be a hot few days. Uh, especially in Delhi, this is, it really works. Uh, yeah. And yes, uh, this is also a butterfly magnet. When it's flowering, you can see a lot of butterflies on it. And it's also a host for uh, uh, common and mortal immigrants. Uh, bear. Bear also has a lot of cultural stories actually. Uh, most Gurdwaras, if you go to, would have a bear 
right in the compound it's supposed to be uh, i think shiva's tree and known to be the undestructibility so will grow in most landscapes makes for amazing delicious fruits uh, everybody from people monkey to birds you see coels cuckoos dots of birds feeding on the bay and uh, tarakas species from our area rounded parrot striped parrot uh, falcon falcon parrot all of these uh, use bear as a host plant basically every place i start planting uh, if it ha- doesn't have much tree cover i go to the bear for oh, one of I'm my sorry, favorite there's a sorry sorry go on go on yeah i was saying this is one of my favorites i have grown it the least i would love to grow it more and more uh, which is kareel i was talking about kareel van yeah uh, <laughs> sorry so kareel is this leafless uh, shrub like tree some old trees get this beautiful slim trunk but otherwise it remains a bush uh, flowers mostly twice a year and uh, whenever it's flowering you will see a lot of butterflies actually pioneers swarm around april march april and at that time uh, kareel also is uh, flowering and you will see a lot of gulls pioneers just around this plant and uh, this is also a host plant for uh, common gull butterflies Okay. most of the caperis species are host plants for butterflies and uh, achar is made out of its fruit i've tried it just once mm-hmm. i don't eat so achar but people say it's the best it's quite a favorite in rajasthan and yes, it's also yes. you can't it's hard to germinate it from seeds right yes. so unless the seed has passed through the guts of birds you cannot germinate yes. it through yes. seeds which is why it's a difficult uh, you know tree to grow you'll have to use cuttings to grow it but you know also what i was saying was that here's the idea you know you grow natives whether they are grasses they are shrubs or they are trees and they will all automatically attract butterflies they will yes. all automatically attract birds so you don't have to think too much about it you just figure out what is your native species palette for your region mm-hmm. and you work on you know bringing those in and you will automatically get everything yes. you know it it will it will attract everything there exactly so i think uh shetut is kind of a naturalized plant but also in the interest of time i'm going to move ahead a little mm-hmm. but i love uh, palash and uh, you know this time i you know i was watching i was i was doing some tree watches and i was watching a palash tree in the city and i was seeing so many of these blue butterflies on it and i i wasn't sure which species it was but you know when i saw your slide your i was like oh it it must have been this it like yes, absolutely people. could not have been anything else yes, it must yes. have been this one um and again like such a beautiful it's a beautiful tree and we don't have enough of them in the city in our urban areas over here because it's supposed to be the original native tree of delhi right i mean the i've heard so many people including my professors from college who would say palash is the native tree and i said but i've never seen a palash where is it if it's a native tree where is it yeah, uh, not in our are, urban landscapes anymore exactly sure. i think we need so many many more of these i know a house um, in uh, on the road after defense colony a backyard has a very small backyard as a palash always wanted to meet yeah, and then road. you know books get written about where each tree where the location of each yes. tree yes. <laughs> is known <laughs> uh, we do have a lot of palash you know in the ravli area even in the ridge area so if you go to buddha jayanti park there's a lot of palash over yes, there yes and it's easily uh, grown so i think to... we can have a lot more yeah it's easily grown from seed so people please please plant palash if you and it's a small tree it doesn't really need much space so it it can be planted in smaller spaces also um we do have a lot of other uh, 
few other plants and trees that you had seen pictures of but you know i'm going to stop here for the butterflies and we can make a list of these and you know share with people yes. so they can go through Absolutely. it later at their own time and these are you've already spoken about babool and yes. ronch again very very beautiful trees and it's very easy to notice them when they're flowering because mm. that's how i started noticing them last me year too, me too me along too. all of that vasant kunj and gurgaon area you know suddenly these trees were flowering and it's like oh this is ronj and this is babool it's not just a random jungly exactly, you know species exactly. it's it's taken on definition it's a definite like exact tree or species and that um, opens the video into the distinct features of all these plants as in then you start seeing right. that oh ronj bark is so different from kumta from babool all the differences right. yeah flowers is a good window into this world otherwise it's it all it's all wo oh, kaante wale pe it it is all ha jungli hai paudhe hain kuch hare hare hain and the moment the trees are flowering many of them flower in spring but many of them are also flower in october in in mm. the delhi area that's also another flowering season for natives yes so so look out for them all of these i mean all of these these are trees these are shrubs they are all amazing to for yeah, you know and now it has become so easy while most of these are recognized by uh, google lens apps like google lens you can just you know see a beautiful flower try and get to it take a photograph and you'll know what species it is so it's they, they, it's not hard to find these things are easy right and then finally uh, you know i think you wanted to talk about a dusa uh, so he was mentioning just yesterday just the plant that everybody can grow it's mm-hmm. uh, has high medicinal value it's a great pollinator uh, great for you know your throat and your sinus and your cough just uh, take a few leaves grind them and mix them with water mm-hmm. or any other thing and take the juice and it's really really effective i would urge everybody to first of course grow it and then try out this uh, leaf juice thing that i'm saying it's very easy to do and very very effective for uh, cold sore throat and all those things so a plant that almost a local plant that you'll only find in the jungle but i don't see any reason why it shouldn't be in all like kadi patta it shouldn't be in all our houses or like aloe vera so and yeah and you know the sunbirds love it they absolutely oh, yes. love it if you have adusa you will definitely get the, the sunbirds the birds are full of nectar so yeah yeah they love it a uh, jungli bear oh, sorry jungli karonda again beautiful you have a um, cultivated variety oh. karonda which has big fruit but you have also have this uh, yeah. jungli variety Delhi variety is of course cultivated one. Much, right. yeah. This is the cultivated variety. Right? So the and cultivated and again, again, the... all of them, right? And all of the, and I think you mentioned jungle karonda. I mean, if we can get them, they have lower water requirement. So much oh yes, more that is the difference between that's what period. that's why I put this uh, here. So you have yeah. like we started out with that uh, 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 flambago, which we have chitrak as the native mm. variety. Here also you have. Uh, a uh, cultivated karonda and a jungli karonda the cultivated has more fruit bigger fruit but the jungli one will take uh, no water no care no absolutely no soil addendums it will grow anywhere so that is the advantage of you know by anywhere i mean you don't take the jungli karonda and grow it in uh, wet regions of northeast it won't grow there because it's not native from there so in our region it's much much easier to work with a jungli karonda than with a karonda and uh jhad peer which is again a uh, native bear much, right the again the fruit is much now, appreciated but nobody plants it yeah <laughs> and you know a lot of these plants karonda bear i think they would make such excellent bushes if you want to plant bushes i mean yes. please experiment with them instead of just I I personally just don't like putranjiva bushes like I um I just don't like them okay there are many many reasons which I won't get into now but they will make much better bushes if you really need bushes some really and these bushes uh, will be alive you know they won't be these 
uh, edifice exactly, of the exactly. they are alive at all times and you can you can get some the fruits bird, some butterfly well. something yes yeah and few to trees the here uh, ficus is yeah. always a good one to go to i put in shetut uh, for butterflies and for birds also i know it's naturalized but uh, it's a very fast growing tree and uh, we are doing a, a, a study on suppression of vilayati kikar and we are using a lot of uh, shetut for that so fast growing tree does well in our area uh, yeah can has the power to suppress prosopagulli flora so loved by butterflies and birds and of course human beings also so i thought yeah. it's a good tree to have and same you know that is really really my favorite do you want to talk about it so hey <laughs> yes yes so you should talk about same <laughs> i i mean it's one of the most beautiful trees and so with the same the thing is the it it is a ornithophilus tree like the flowers they attract birds because the birds pollinate it which is why it produces so much nectar and i have tasted the nectar it's very very sweet and i think just in delhi i must have seen between 20 to 25 different bird species that visit the absolutely when it's flowering easily yeah i mean just in the city right not even in one of the wild areas where you might have even greater bird diversity just with so imagine you know, we in have the list of, of the 300 road, and you have seen 10% on one tree yeah and you know on a uh, semel in the middle of the road if it's flowering birds don't care it's in the middle of the road it's flowering it has nectar Yes, it yes. is one of the most amazing trees. Of course, it needs it's a big tree. It needs a larger space to grow in, but it's a very very good tree. It have space in a park, or you know, you are in a housing society which has some space. I mean, not over a basement area, but you really have deep soil, uh, ground. Please grow it. I think it's a beautiful tree and. Uh, it's an absolute joy you know to watch this tree and uh, i think finally we have uh, we will i repeatedly uh, mentioned we will share other resources also but these are some um, places you can look at if you uh, go online especially i found butterflies to find out what are the you know host plants or larval host plants for your particular regions but this is going in a roundabout way because you go from the butterfly to the plant what we are trying to say is you plant the native plants of your region you will automatically get it so you don't need to worry about which butterflies do i need you you know yes. focus on the plants and the trees you will just get everything exactly and um the other thing uh, we do we'll take up a few questions i know we are uh, over time and uh, khushbu can we take questions for about 10 minutes is that okay and then uh, yeah i would love to hear a few questions uh, it's always great to interact with people and you know know what people want to know yeah and then um khushbu can we yes we have some couple of questions oh, yeah okay. we can do that shall we okay thanks um and of course for those who have to leave please do leave your emails we will get back to you on all queries you have here and also send us further queries on our email we will definitely get back to you on that so i am just going to randomly take up some questions and definitely i'll get back to the other people on email uh, rajat is asking would butterflies come in a terrace garden yes absolutely 14th floor also yeah yeah yes yes um i mean Small i garden, have big I garden have high garden low garden everywhere butterflies will come you plant the right plants and you will see butterflies don't use poisons and you will see butterflies and uh, you know especially the, the red sparrow <laughs> so i have a question to so well ah uh, yes please chitra varna thodu please adr lidrala so sir chit thor sir illa idrala illa chit alla anten chit thor sir uh if you can raise your hand i can unmute you to and then you can ask your question 
okay until we get there uh so hill there was a question about lantana about what and uh, lantana because of yeah. course it's an invasive but it's great yes. for butterflies so what and are birds. your thoughts on that my and thoughts yes. are that i don't plant it but if it's already there i don't disturb it if i'm making a butterfly habitat but for our restoration sites we are working on a lantana removal project also so it's a long term thing it takes 4 to 5 years to get rid of lantana yeah so again it depends on your choice and your choice you have to know your choice is going to have consequences and uh this is a question from nerzari while it's great to create parks with specific native species we understand that we can never recreate the complexity and magnificence of old grown natural forests so how do we as a group work towards protecting the remaining natural forests in the country which are always under attack and i'm just uh, nerzari this this is such uh, this is just a large very long complex discussion but so hill do you have two words about this and this could obviously yeah, this, this, take this up pages this needs a this but... needs a concentrated effort mm -hmm. when uh, in terms of volunteers come to my center i ask them a very simple question what do you think is uh, the biggest threat to wildlife in india and people have a lot of answers but the right answer is habitat destruction and it's happening on a huge huge scale you know we are fighting for 1000 trees 10000 trees or what not but there are hectares thousands of square kilometer of national parks being destroyed uh, in our name in for making roads for making railway tracks for connecting uh, uh, rivers for uh, oil lots of things happening across our nation it needs a concentrated effort but mostly it needs a informed citizenry if you are informed uh, there's less chances uh, people in power can get away with stuff so, you know it's uh, a Padma... this native seed bank project is a great example of how it works right uh, uh, say 10 years ago mm, no government office wanted to plant native plants but because there's a interest in people uh the constituency stakeholders have voice if they raise it uh change does happen slowly but it does happen right uh padma has a question padma sure. you can unmute and ask your question please okay the question i have is just like uh, there are best times uh during the year where you can go for tree spotting is there a time uh, of the year which is best for butterflies and which is the worst time which is the time that you don't see butterflies at all is it in winter yes so winter would be it's not so no time would be that you don't see butterflies at all okay. there are some butterflies which are winter butterflies but they are less in number so the best time to see the active life cycle like if you are interested in eggs and caterpillars in all of the four stages of a butterfly monsoon in our area is the best time to see or count butterflies then uh, pre monsoon and post monsoon is the best time okay so the uh, so then winters is the time when you see the uh, the least bit of action for butterflies yes we okay. start looking at birds <laughs> okay yes currently uh, i'm um, spotting a lot of Ajwal, butterflies yes Currently, Sorry, I, yeah. I see a lot. I see. I'm seeing a lot of butterflies in Chandigarh. Lots and lots of them, and they're like in swarm. So yeah. I, I can relate to what he's saying. Probably it's because of the monsoon. Yes, yes. Im immigrants is what you are seeing there in uh, Chandigarh. Chandigarh is also a very green city. Yeah. Fortunately, one of the green cities in India. so uh prajwal just give me a minute i want to ask this one question and then i'll come to you uh, there was a question earlier uh, in the chat that what are the easiest trees to plant in noida type soil that is often water logged and grazed by goats farash so green belt near someone's house farash farash or palash yeah water logged farash uh, yeah. it's also called chao 
yeah and uh, you know in one of the previous presentations padma shared a photo of the flowers oh, of wow. the farash that she grew <laughs> on her terrace fantastic um and <laughs> the question is uh, should we also not plant the much maligned eucalyptus in such areas to drain out the water from the soil no yes, no eucalyptus <laughs> australian somebody asked about jungle jalebi also yes not jungle indian. jalebi not also indian. and we are uh, we finding jungle jalebi along so many drains and wastelands actually in delhi yes. it's it been promoted looks, I mean, it's yeah been it grows promoted. easily yeah. It grows easily in two or three fast growing so yeah like padma is saying is being promoted but people don't know i met a lot of across india i met a lot of uh, naturalists who even people connected with the forest think that oh jungle jalebi is jungle jalebi it has jungle and jalebi yeah. <laughs> i not be <laughs> i also used to think that seriously the name right <laughs> yes yeah, so names are very you know yeah. like imli is an example <laughs> there are lots of these examples where names are very misleading right ashok uh, Ash- are... sita ashok is threatened right and ashok is everywhere even if you go looking for sita ashok in a nursery the nursery wala will give you ashok he like take this this is ashok oh so yeah names matter if i know choices um yeah the and you know there are fish very slow you know it's a very slow growing tree so that's the reason the other ones have and taken it's, over it's also not uh, native to the delhi area right no, no, sita ashok is, is not native i'm just talking from about south, a, yeah it's yeah, native to india south and sri lanka but it's threatened it's actually threatened one of the few species we know of trees right. which are threatened so which are threatened most right. are data deficient we don't even know about uh, their status but sita ashok we know for a fact that is disappearing for la- from our right. lands here uh prajwal would you want to uh, go ahead and ask your question so hell uh, it was a very good session i really liked it so uh, i was planning to put some uh, boundary bushes to avoid uh, wild boars coming yeah, prajwal you will have to speak up i can't hear i'll i can repeat it so hell i'll repeat it sure. yeah go ahead prajwal Rajpal, where are you based? Okay, I we can't hear you. I think we lost you. But his question was the for boundary bushes, uh, because I think a lot of goats, uh, no pigs or goats come in, and so what would be some plants that could be used as bushes? So the best plants would be uh, uh, plants which do well on edges in uh, not so good soil, and make these. you know bushes which are impenetrable so jungli karonda would be a very good one uh, kanthari would be a very good one uh, uh, gangeti would be a very good one and a mix of these for one fence would be the best solution even if you're looking for you know uh, a type of solution don't look for one plant for the answer try out four five different ones and you'll see which one is the best and having more biodiversity means having more plant diversity means having more bio, biodiversity so it's directly related to what you can do in the space uh we had questions about you know native plant resources for bangalore and earlier also for mumbai we'll work on that later so he'll we'll put together maybe help them connect your resource person from that area yes yes from bangalore uh, and um, delhi and and mumbai and both bombay yes uh, uh ramakrishnan ji is asking about list of uh, trees for you know gardens we'll put that together we've spoken about it a little bit we'll share that with you and right now i have I'll a very ask, small uh, handbook with the butterfly picture and the plant picture somebody made it for me actually an architect made right, it for me right. so i can just share it and you can pass it along right uh and maybe like one last question kavita can you ask your question and for all other people i'm sorry we could not get to you you can put your question in the chat box or email us and we will get back to you with, with yeah my bad sorry i took a long uh, time uh, Good, uh, good evening, so here everybody. It's just a small question, sir. We I stay in a society uh, where the pavements and everything is, you know, concrete and all. So we have just a bed uh, next to the boundary wall. 
so uh, uh, though we have the freedom and the uh, society encourages all these i stay in gurgaon so i uh, can i plant these uh, native species in those uh, next to the boundary walls yes yes with no problem at all and you should if, if it's a boundary wall don't go for trees go for uh, Uh, shrubs if it's planting very close to the wall but if you have space from the wall say about 6 to 8 feet then trees That's would also that's not there do. sir the 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 bed which is there around our society it's i, I think it's about a kilometer uh, um, 700 meters the periphery is of 700 meters and uh, we have we have trees it's not that they we are planting the trees many uh, series and all there but i want to plant this native species can i do that Yes, shrubs. It'd be okay, great. Okay, no, no. Uh, uh, adusa, adusa would okay. be a good thing. Bajradanti would be a good one. Uh, uh, Jungli karonda again, Gangeti. They, these would be very good. Thank you, sir. Okay, Teens, I. Kantheri, okay. Kantari, but, but you don't get, suggest but, that we should grow ronj and these uh, the trees. Though we have many. So if you if you want to go into de detail, yes, you can grow uh, not ronj. You can go pralash. You, they're not easily broken, right? So you don't want anything falling on your uh, wall, or it. No, because you know, disturbing the structure. Yeah, because we should be having gulmohar, sir. But uh, the branches are very weak, and they destroyed one of the car. Yes, yes, yes. So, yes. So the, That's what I'm saying. So bishtendu would be a good tree to have. It's uh, mostly evergreen. Uh, Amal Tas is also a good tree to have. Not, doesn't have, it break sir. easily? Palash would be a great tree to have. Breaks doesn't break easily. So these would be a, some good trees to have. Do the isn't there? The list is immense, man. There's a lot. There's uh, a lot. Uh, I'll speak your dialect, sir. Harsh Shringar. Harsh Shringar would be a perfect one yes, to have. Yes, sir. The, I love that plant. <laughs> Yes, the, yes, the, the, it's uh, beautiful. Shrub, shrub, uh, shrub, uh, shrub. One of the first plants uh, I planted uh, in Asola was Hardshringa next to the bathroom. Yes. I visualized yes. it in a way that I wanted people see, going, uh, visitors this. going to the bathroom having uh, flowers at their feet. Uh, just to share <laughs> share one childhood memory, sir. We Please. used to make rangolis in the morning with those uh, when I was a kid. The way uh, Velari has shared. It, yes, it's with my childhood. Yeah. I and my mother we still collect the flowers. So that's still a ritual during that time when the tree flowers, you know, <laughs> that's coming. Yeah, yeah. Ashwini was the plant you gave all. us too. Yeah, but I yes. have child. I had memories with it. You know, I can write stories about it, like pages and pages and pages about it. Which is why memories are such an important part of, and you know, connection with nature. How and you know everything that we talked about today, building our connection with nature. You know, can start right from our homes. And these birds and butterflies and plants, they offer us a window, um, you know, into that world. And I think over the last year, it's become even more apparent with you know the pandemic. We've all faced challenges. You know, we've all been uh, faced different kind of stresses. And for me, that small patch where I now have too many plants, <laughs> but which attracts a lot of butterflies and birds, it's been my heaven. Like I have managed. to you know deal with some some of the stresses just by being with the plants uh, just by observing the butterflies and having someone to share it with right so if you become part of a community where you can share that because yes. i saw a painted lady butterfly once just once it came and sat next to me and i was just shocked i was over the moon i said like, i have to share it with someone you know who do i share it with <laughs> Right, so get it with me, and so hey, sir, please, please share us the you know from where to procure these plants, uh, the the native species. In yes, and there's a couple yes, of. Yes, ma'am. Uh, uh, Vijay, uh, I am Gurgaon runs a nursery. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm, and, I'm, I'm, 
I am in touch with them, sir. Yeah. I, I keep going roots. for their plantation rice. And edible Great. roots and I am good cow would be the two main ones. But also some of these uh, plants, you know, we can find in the regular nurseries also. Okay. Some of these, not all. Yeah, yeah. And some of also... these plants, some of these plants you can find on your own outside your house. Okay. And and that's what I was going to say. And also let's get in the habit of growing these plants ourselves. You can grow one or two that you really want. Yes. You know, just yes. On there. Um, I am so sorry, Raja and Krish. I mean, uh, we really, really need to close the session. Can you drop your emails here, and I will definitely get back to you. Sohail, um, I'll, you know, we'll fix up a call with Sohail, and we can get back to you uh, no with whatever your questions and answers are. And uh, thank you so much, Sohail. And thank you to everyone for staying with us for such a long time. I know we overshot. We always overshoot the time. There's so much to talk about. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed it. And I hope everybody was inspired to do, to take this up. You know, take this up in your own houses, in your homes, in your neighborhoods. Um, and let's we can, I think we can all contribute towards making our cities a little more livable and a little more, uh, bring in a little more happiness in, in our lives. <laughs> yes, thank you. Thank about. you, Val. Uh, it's been, uh, it's been fun for me too. And uh, of course, I can't say this enough that uh, talking about native plants is uh, almost as important as planting these plants because before you plant a real tree, you need to plant an idea. And uh, so thank, thank you for the work you're doing. And uh, I appreciate being part of this. So thank you to everyone. Thank you, Kushbu, for providing all the support so that we could do the session. You all have our email. Do write in. Uh, I always... Uh, because that's the easiest way to reach us and we will connect you with all the resource people, you know, who can help you out with this. Um, thank you so much. And uh, just a final uh, request because uh, we have, you know, uh, Mr. VP Rao, he has established a beautiful forest in the Commonwealth Games Village. Like it's an absolutely stunning area, which has, I don't know, hundreds of species of birds and butterflies which have been photographed by Rupa Ji, who's also here in our session. Uh, you know, and I keep seeing the photos every day. They have all these native plants that we talked about <laughs> in large numbers. Uh, and, you know, he's also invited everybody to visit that forest, that forest area, if you're interested. Is Dr. Again, Dr. Drop us Dr. Rao, email. right? Yes, yes. He, he used to be at uh, Zakharusen College, right? No, 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 no. That, that's Dr. Prabhakar Rao. This is, uh, this is Mr. VP Rao. He is uh, from the civil services. Okay. Um, so, you know, write into us. Uh, Khushbu, I still see uh, Raja and Krish with raised hands. Uh, I wanted to close the session. So what, what do you suggest? <laughs> I'm feeling so guilty. I'll take the question. Unfortunately, but you have our email ID, so they, they can reach out to us. Right. Sorry, it's just, you know, there's another session. Uh, yeah, my on bad. The Sorry. Same IIT. No, no, it was, I mean, we will always have many more questions than we can answer. Yeah, thank you, um, everybody, for so paying attention, and uh, hopefully it was useful. Right. So thank you so much and uh, we'll have one final session next week. We have one more guest speaker, one more expert coming in. So stay in touch. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks, Sohil. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.